Well, good evening, everyone coming in. Um, if you don't mind, we like to see where everybody's from. So if you can put where you're from in the chat, we would love to know where everyone's from tonight. And that also tells me the chat's working. Thank you. I'm in New Jersey too. How you like all that snow we got the other day? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Nebraska. Okay. California in the house. Just join in. Put in the chat where you're from tonight. Also, I have a question for everybody. Which do you prefer, dogs or cats? I know that's a tricky question with this group because you're probably going to come up and say some different animal. But, and you can, but I just thought dogs or cats was a good icebreaker. See who's winning, dogs. Mm. Cats are coming in strong. <laughs> I saw Vicki O'Grain and she had cats. Oh, I yes. Think, I would, yeah, I know. I would think nothing, nothing different. No. She, <laughs> yeah, her cats. I was on a conference with her once, a conference call, and her cat was marching across her keyboard. Right, Vicki? <laughs> Mine's in the room with me here, so I think I'm going to have to get up and kick her out. Yeah, well, it's okay. Um, but thanks everyone for joining. I'll just go ahead and get things started so we can get this off on time. My name is Laurie Davin. Welcome to the NAFTA 2024 webinars. Um, our topic tonight is preventing the progression of periodontal disease, which it is national dental month. Correct ladies? Yes. They're shaking their heads. So, um, our speakers tonight are Mary Berg and Kara Burns, and we welcome them. But we also have a sponsor tonight, and our sponsor is Aura Strip DX. And we have Jameson from Aura Strip DX tonight, so he's going to give a little bit of a, a little bit of a speech here in a minute after I get some housekeeping rules done. Um, questions again, I can't stress enough. If you have a true question for our speakers, please, please, please put it in the Q and A. If you put it in the chat, it'll get lost and it may not get answered and they will only be answering questions at the end. So you can put your question in the Q&A at any time, but questions will be answered at the end of the webinar tonight. So just to make sure, again, put it in the Q&A if you have a, a true question. Um, CEs, the certificates will be issued out via if you're a member of NAFTA in your member profile in the next week or so. I'm getting ready to go to Vegas, so I'm going to be gone till next Friday. So give me a little bit of grace on that one. But I wanted to turn it over to Jameson now, and he's going to give us a little uh, information on Aura Strip. Jameson? Thank you. Yes, my name is Jameson. I'm the lead account manager for Aura Strip DX. I thank you all for allowing me to speak tonight. I promise I'll be short to the point so we can get on to the main event. Uh, Aura Strip DX is a 10 second rapid detection test for periodontal disease in awake dogs and cats. In its earliest stages, perio has no visual signs, no redness or swelling inflammation that you can show the client, nothing that you can point to and say, hey, there's something wrong here. But if there is infection below the gums, thiols will be present in the mouth and the test will react along a bright yellow color gradient provided on both on the bottle and on this scorecard here, giving you a visual tool to show the client to say, hey, something's going on below the gums. We may not be able to see it, but your pet is in the beginning stages of periodontal disease. You don't have to take our word for it either. We ran the test and it came back positive, giving them visual confirmation. Now in human dentistry, we don't just, we, they don't let us leave before they know when we're coming back. So on the back side of our scorecard is where you can put your prescription. Say the pet tested positive for the early stages of perio. You can say, well, let's send you home. We need to increase at home care, nightly brushings, dental chews, things like that. 
but I want to see you back in six months so we can run the test again. Make sure we're staying ahead of it. You put the name, date, give them the card. It goes on the fridge. And now you know when you're going to see your client again. They're $4 per test strip. They come in tubes of 40. So it's $160 per tube. That's right now pricing them anywhere from $8 to $12 per test. But about half our clients don't charge for them at all. They include them in their wellness and dental packages because the real opportunity is in forward bookings and increased dental procedures. Studies have shown that with use of Oristrip in every wellness exam, compliance increases by 50% resulting in a 140% increase in revenue from radiology, 72% for overall dinner procedures year over year. For the month of February, to celebrate National Pet Dental Health Month, we're doing a buy one, get one free special. So that's two tubes or 80 tests for $160, so just $2 per test. And they have a shelf life of two years. That special is available through us directly on our website. There's going to be a QR code at the end of the presentation, I believe, uh, for oristripdx.com. Uh, and also through our distributor partners, Covetris, MWI, Vetcove, and Victor Medical. Now, without further ado, the, the main event, um, our speakers tonight are Mary Berg. Uh, and forgive me, I'm not in the industry, so if, I, I'm going to stumble over a few of these acronyms, but uh, Mary L. Berg, BS, RBT, LATG, BTS, and Dentistry. Mary is a charter member of the Academy of uh, Veterinary Dental Technicians and received her veterinary technician specialty in dentistry in June of 2006, recertified in 2020. Mary worked in research for over 31 years, specializing in products aimed at improving the oral health of companion animals, continues to work with companies to evaluate the, the efficacy of their products. In addition to her research background, she was the practice manager and dental technician specialist at general practice for seven years. She's an adjunct to two distance veterinary technology programs and is currently the president of Beyond the Crown Veterinary Education. She has over 17 years of experience teaching dentistry to veterinary teams using practical and easy to master methods. Mary is actively involved in NAFTA, AVDT, AVMA, AAVSB, F4BD, and KVTA. Mary was named the NAFTA Veterinary Technician of the Year by NAFTA in 2020 received the ABDT's Excellence in Dentistry Education in 2019. In addition, Mary is a speaker and a wet lab instructor at numerous state and national conferences and has multiple articles placed in professional publications and journals, written several textbook chapters, and her Companion Animal Dentistry for Veterinary Technicians textbook was published in 2020. Our other speaker is Kara Burns, MS, MED, LVT, VTS in Nutrition, and VTS, I believe, Honorary in Internal Medicine and Dentistry. Kara Burns is a licensed veterinary technician with a master's degree in physiology and master's degree in counseling psychology. Kara is the founder and past president of the Academy of Veterinary Nutrition Technicians. She teaches nutrition courses around the world. Kara is an independent nutritional and well being consultant, the director of veterinary nurse development for Well Haven Pet Health, and is the editor in chief of today's veterinary nurse. She's a member of many national, international, and state associations and holds positions of many boards in the profession and is a past president of NAFTA. She has authored many articles, textbooks, and textbook chapters, and is an internationally invited speaker focusing on the topics of nutrition, leadership, and technician utilization. Ms. Burns was recently named the Bridge Club 2024 Industry Icon Award recipient, the first veterinary technician to be recognized as the Bridge Club Icon. She has been featured on the cover of Veterinary Technician Journal and the NAFTA Journal, and in Pet Vet Magazine. She was named the North American Veterinary Conference Technician Speaker of the Year in 2013, 16, and again in 2021. So without further ado, our speakers. Well, thank you very much, Jameson. I really appreciate the intro and I'm so honored to be here um, tonight to not only um, represent uh, Oristrip DX, but to also co-present with one of my um, friends and icons, uh, Kara Burns. So, Kara, you're in charge. You're driving the ship. So, okay. can you go ahead and move the slides along there? All right, I will. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm going to let Mary take it, um, and I will be back uh, soon um, if I don't interrupt her beforehand. We will. Right. We yeah, I know. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. All right, so we're going to talk about preventing the progression of periodontal disease. And um, the objectives tonight, we're just going to talk about what periodontal disease is, how we can detect it, how it progresses, what happens when periodontal disease develops, how every member of the team is in, 
important in prevention of periodontal disease and some of the roles that technicians can play, um, not only in helping to communicate to pet owners, but also um, ensure that home care is being done to prevent progression of disease. <clears throat> so what is periodontal disease? Well, we're gonna talk a little bit about it. And some of you guys have probably heard some of these stats before, but periodontal disease begins with inflammation around the tissues of the teeth. It is the most common disease occurring in dogs and cats. And, you know, right now in this presentation, we say 80% of all dogs and cats have some degree of periodontal disease. That's adult dogs, usually over two years of age. There's some discussion in the, in the field that we feel it's even higher than that, probably closer to 85% uh, percent or around there um, have some disease. That means eight, um, almost nine of every 10 dogs that walk into your practice and cats have some degree of periodontal disease. And this one, a lot of people may not really truly believe me when I say that dental problems are one of the top three pet owner concerns, um, but realistically, they may not realize they're being concerned about dentistry, but they may be, you know, you're going through that whole interview, you've got the, the history taking, and you'll say, is there any other concerns? And they're like, oh my God, his breath is horrendous. All right. Well, that is more than likely a dental problem. They just aren't really relating the two together. And then calculus and gingivitis are two of the most common diseases and conditions diagnosed by veterinarians in pets of all ages. And that's actually from some data from AHA. So here's the definition. Periodontal disease, we also call it periodontitis, is an infectious disease caused by plaque and the resultant inflammatory response. So there's two things here to remember. It's an infectious disease and it's caused by plaque. We tend to get really hung up on how much calculus is on the teeth when we're looking at the mouth and trying to figure out what we should, you know, what kind of grade of periodontal disease it is. I don't care about the calculus. I want to look at the gingiva because it's the plaque and the bacteria in the plaque that is causing that infection we know as periodontal disease. So what is that? Plaque actually starts to form, and I'm sure some of you guys have been here for a bit. If you took your tongue and rubbed it over your, your teeth right now, you're going to kind of feel a, almost a slime layer. I know that sounds really fun, um, but that layer is actually the first layer of plaque forming on your teeth, and it starts to lay down a pellicle within about 20 minutes of a dental cleaning or brushing, okay? Now, the biofilm forms and continues to form within 24 hours. And it's hard to see it. It's usually yellow or clear. Yes, we can use disclosing solutions to see it or a black light works well to disclose it. But a lot of times we can't actually see the plaque very well. So it's made up of a soft gelatinous matrix consisting of the bacteria and the bacterial byproducts. And those bacterial byproducts are things such as glycoproteins from the saliva, oral bacteria, there's lipids, cellular debris, and some extracellular polysaccharides. The glycoproteins and those polysaccharides are what actually helps that plaque adhere and stick to the tooth, okay? Now, again, that plaque starts as a biofilm and you cannot treat plaque just by throwing antibiotics at it or antimicrobials. They're not going to work. They might work for a short period of time, but they're not effective. The best treatment we need to prevent this is what we call routine plaque removal. We do it every day, right? We brush our teeth every day, twice a day. Um, that, when we keep that plaque at bay, we're preventing that inappropriate host response, which again is chronic inflammation. And it prevents that systemic infect, uh, impact on the patient. So when we look at plaque, plaque not only grows onto the crown of the tooth, but it grows up below the gum line, okay? So when it's on the crown of the tooth, that biofilm and that first layer of plaque is actually a gram-positive um, aerobic bacteria. But once it starts to move up subgingivally, it starts to change. And the type of bacteria that are present are gonna be facultative at first, which means they need air or might not need air. And then of course we get into the anaerobic. And these anaerobic bacteria are usually gram-negative, and on top of that, they become black pigmenting anaerobic bacteria, which are really, you know, they're the bad guys. Um, and that's what starts to cause all the problems we see with periodontal disease. So the bacteria, the types we see in the mouth 
are aerobic on the crown, facultative at the gingival margin, and aerobic when it gets down into the periodontal pockets. That subgingival plaque is, again, made up of bacteria and bacterial spirochetes. And these black pigmenting bacteria that we talked about are, they're going to start producing things such as endotoxins, volatile sulfur compounds. Those are the things that actually give that, that uh, periodontal disease that bad smell that we can smell. A lot of times I consider it kind of almost like a rotten egg kind of smell. Um, they're going to have a little bit of ammonia. They're going to put out some protolytic enzymes, and they're going to impair the neutrophils that try to come in to save the day. And then they create these inflammatory cytokines. So when we talk about periodontal disease progression, as I said, the neutrophils come in because neutrophils like to come in and try to save the day. They're going to ride in on their little white horses with their little white hats, and they're trying to kill all the bacteria. All right. And sometimes what happens is they're so overwhelmed, okay, that they start to actually shift from being a good thing to a dysbiotic environment. In other words, those bacteria start to become hyperactive and they start um, releasing some, uh, you know, cytokines and things like that are going to lead to tissue damage. So, you know, neutrophils are good to a certain degree, but then they start to switch teams. So what is inflammation? Well, inflammation, we all see inflammation. We probably see it on a daily basis, um, but it's a vascular and cellular response to trauma or infection. The body wants to try to dispose of those microorganisms that are invading below the gum line and those foreign bodies. And they're trying to be there to repair it. That's what the neutrophils job is. Um, however, it, you know, it can actually... Um, excuse my train of thought there, but they actually protect the body by localizing and removing the problem if we if it works the way it wants to, with the way we need inflammation to work. I can actually talk tonight, I promise. Now, inflammation itself is, you know, it can be an hour lecture by itself, I promise, but we're going to keep it down to the short and sweet here. It's really complex. It involves a ton of different types of cells. It involves inflammatory mediators. And inflammation in itself is good, okay? Um, because let's say you, you know, you are out, you know, doing something and you sprain your ankle, okay? Well, when you sprain your ankle, it gets inflamed. And the inflammation is there to say, hey, goofball, don't bear weight on me. I need to heal, okay? Well, that is what inflammation's goal is. However, it can become permanent and cause permanent tissue damage which can lead to systemic effects down the road. So this is inflammation. We've all seen this, probably not maybe on a person, um, but inflammation, we have redness and the redness is there because the, the blood vessels have dilated. We get swelling and that's because we have increased proteins in the extracellular osmotic pressures. We have pain because all of those things that, that increased osmotic pressure are irritating the nerve endings. And of course we get warmth and that's gonna be because of the chemical activity that's happening, but it also increases the blood flow. So one of the things that's important to remember with gingivitis is that we have histological changes and we can get clinical gingivitis can be established or established gingivitis can be within two to four days, okay? So if you're not removing plaque on a daily basis, every 24 to 40, or excuse me, 48 to 72 hours, that plaque is gonna calcify into calculus now or tartar. And calculus doesn't cause any issues itself, but it gives more surface area for more plaque. Now that plaque, if it's not removed, can also re relate to the inflammation regarding gingivitis. So within one to three weeks, if it's continuing, it's gonna to continue to pro uh, proliferate we're going to have inflammatory cells. We're going to have increased cavicular fluid, which is the fluid we have in the in the uh, sulcus of between the tooth and the gums, and we start to get collagen loss. So inflammation actually begins at that junction, uh, the junctional epithelial, and again, like I said, plaque grows onto the crown of the tooth, but it also grows subgingivally. And as it goes subgingially, the more neutrophils, the more plasma cells, and the more inflammatory cells we start to see. 
Now there's histological changes again too, where we get that increased cubicular fluid, which I mentioned, which you think would actually be a good thing because it does try to help move out the bacteria and the excadate out of the sulcus. But what also happens is that bacteria then migrates into the larger spaces in that junctional epithelial and into the connective tissues into the periodontal ligament and starts to destroy not only the periodontal ligament, but the cementum and the bone surrounding those teeth. And we start to see these things, okay? All of these factors result in destruction. The first layer is gonna be the epithelial tissues. And then we get increased sulcus depth. Anything over one to three millimeters in a dog, over one millimeter in a cat is considered you know, pathologic. Um, we get the periodontal ligament is starting to be destroyed. And of course, then our alveolar bone is also destroyed. And we have consequences to that, all right? This mouth, I don't know about you guys, but I look at that mouth and I hurt. I still remember this dog so clearly. This is one of the worst dogs I'd ever worked on. This dog had so much inflammation that I could not see the rugae on the roof of his mouth because he was so inflamed. He had what we call palatitis on top of everything else going on in his mouth. It's painful, okay? Um, we have permanent tissue damage. And what happens is every time that animal is eating, that blood, that bacteria is getting into his bloodstream. And pretty soon it starts affecting the kidney, liver, and heart, all right? Now, there have been links to that bacteria that's in this little guy's mouth here in osteoarthritis, okay? We have found some of those bacteria in joints. So there's a link. And a lot of this is coming from human data, but we do have some of it in veterinary medicine as well. And we like, you know, pain to a certain degree is good because like I said, inflammation is there to say, hey, don't step on my sprained ankle. But when pain becomes maladaptive or becomes chronic, it now becomes a disease in and of itself, which is periodontal disease. Now, some people will tell you that periodontal disease isn't painful, but how many of you guys have cleaned that dog's mouth up and three or four days later, you're calling that pet owner to check on Fluffy and they're like, oh my God, they're a puppy again because their mouth doesn't hurt anymore. We've gotten rid of all that nastiness. Now there's consequences. Again, I talked a little bit about some of the systemic ones, but we have localized things too that can happen. We get oral nasal fistulas that are direct communication from the mouth to the sinuses. We can have a pathological fracture. The little Yorkie who jumps off the couch, barely bumps his chin on the floor and fractures his jaw because so much bone loss due to periodontal disease. We can have periocular damage, especially in our brachycephalic animals. Um, we get bone inflammation or, or uh, bone infection called osteomyelitis. And of course we have tooth loss, but don't forget it can affect kidney, liver, and heart as well. The other thing that happens when we have periodontal disease, and this is very well documented in human research, is that there's a big link between periodontal disease and diabetes. And when you have periodontal disease, you're increasing the natural corticosteroids, right? Well, what happens when we have or we have a steroid with an animal? We have increased steroids, we're more than likely possibly going to turn that animal to have diabetes mellitus. So what happens is we can then, if we treated that periodontal disease and we got rid of that raging infection and we got that patient on good home care at home, we could decrease their risk for diabetes, we can improve their kidney values, we can decrease their liver disease and even improve their heart disease. So we have all these things that can happen when we treat these patients. And also again, remember that that bacteria again gets into the mouth, gets into their bloodstream. Um, it starts to have an overall effect of the animal. Um, it's related again to the histological changes in the kidney and then oral disease is a pain that affects the animal's quality of life. We know that it's painful. There's even commercials in humans that point out that it can be painful um, you know, for humans as well. And then of course, the next slide is our stages of periodontal disease. And the one thing that's really important here on this slide is that we as credential or as technicians can cure periodontal disease stage one. Okay, that means if we get that gingivitis, which all stage one is, is just a little bit of red swollen gums, maybe a little bleeding, but we don't have any bone loss, I can take it back to zero. If I get that mouth cleaned up and I get that pet owner on good home care, we can do that for them. Once we get to stage two, three, and four, we can't reverse it, 
but we could either halt it or at least slow the progression by doing a good dental cleaning, getting them in for routine dental cleanings and good home care at home. We don't have to let a two become a three. We don't have to let a three become a four. So what are the goals of treatment? Well, we know periodontal disease is preventable. We're preventing it in our mouths every day by brushing, okay? We're doing everything we can to keep our mouths healthy. We can do the same to our pets. 85% or so of our patients have it, but they don't have to have it. If we contain, maintain that oral health before the tissue is destroyed, and by doing that, we're removing those irritants from the biofilm, we're minimizing the pocket depth, we're keeping plaque and calculus at bay and, uh, and removing that uh, granulated uh, tissue that happens with, the, with periodontal disease. Now remember, when you're cleaning these mouths, if you're only cleaning the crowns, it's not even worth anesthetizing the patient. You have got to do a thorough scaling, root planing, and polishing. And by root planing, that means we're going to use the periodontal tip for our scalers below the gum line. And then we're gonna go in with a curette to make sure that we've removed everything. And then even doing something we call subgingival curettage, where we turn that curette around and remove the first layer of epithelial tissue um, inside that pocket to help it adhere better. Now, that's the first step. We can also put periaceutics, antibiotics, directly into those pockets to help heal. We can get that patient on good home care. Daily plaque removal is best. There's all kinds of options out there, and we're going to address those later in this presentation. But we need to have them in regularly for professional cleanings because it's not just a one and done, guys. Um, we have to continue, just like we get our teeth cleaned every six months, maybe a year, but every six months preferably, and we still brush twice a day, okay? Um, we have to make sure that we realize that the progression in our mouth is exactly the same as it happens in dogs. All right, Kara, it's all yours. All right. Thank you, Mary. That was um, that was awesome. And I know that you are going to jump in some more here, but but let's, um, you know, Mary's been talking a lot about periodontal disease, right? And so if we look at controlling periodontal disease, you know, if, if I were to ask you, you know, what makes that up? Well, you see it. Thorough professional examination, right? Um, appropriate periodontal care and therapy. So, you know, COHAT, a comprehensive oral health assessment and treatment. And that means an assessment of the whole mouth with an oral exam and dental x-ray as it relates to the patient's overall health and habits. And then a treatment plan is created for any problems found. Now, we also want to talk about the, the third part of this, which, you know, dentistry, you know, it encompasses it really involves us as veterinary technicians. And that's, you know, we know Mary loves dentistry. And this is one of the reasons I love dentistry. You know, we are being properly utilized we're, or we're being more utilized by, you know, doing a professional exam, um, by participating, if not, you know, performing the COHAT and then effective home care. So first, we're just going to, you know, talk about, remind you of some of the things that Mary touched on. Periodontal disease, the number one health problem in small animal patients. And remember, our owners aren't picking up on this. And when we flip these lips or when we have them under anesthesia and we're like, oh my God, that is the worst mouth. How did the owner not pick up on it? Well, our patients try to hide pain, right? And they try to, you know, just muddle through whatever's going on. And so oftentimes they are showing minimal outward clinical signs. And oftentimes therapy isn't initiated until late in the disease. And that's what Mary's been, been trying to tell us. And it's not only the number one health problem, but it's also a significantly undertreated disease condition. And remember, dental problems are among the top three pet owner concerns. 
So just a real, could I add one thing here? You knew I was going to jump in because yeah, you know, no, absolutely. <laughs> um, there's actually a study out that shows that only about 14% of patients, uh, dogs and cats get care at the veterinary hospital for dental uh, procedures. So that means we're missing the boat on about 66% of them. Um, so um, I didn't mention this earlier, but when I talk to pet owners, I never use the word dental because first of all, it's a noun. Uh -huh. It's not a procedure. So please stop using that. Mm -hmm. And second of all, I use pain and infection um, when I'm talking to pet owners about oral disease to let them know that this is something that can be painful. And I'm going to be quiet now. <laughs> no, please, please don't. We're in this together. And pain and infection is a great, great term or two terms to use because those are terms that our clients understand. When they hear that their, pain, their pet is painful, they will take action. When they hear that their pet has an infection, they will take action. And so we're going to talk uh, more about you know, some of the, the home care, but first I do want to mention, um, you heard Jameson earlier, Oristrip D DX is a thiol test. It's a test that we as veterinary technicians can and should be doing in the exam room. And it's for the early detection of active periodontal disease in awake dogs and cats. And we don't have to go through you know, every bullet, but the important things here is the results are readily available and easily visible within 10 seconds. We're just gonna glide that white pad of the test strip along the maxillary gingival margin or that upper gum line of the awake animal in the exam room. And then we're going to watch. This is the strip that uh, Jameson was showing you earlier and we're going to watch, does yellow color develop on this pad? If it does, then that's telling us that there's presence of metabolites of pathogenic anaerobic bacteria in that gingival sulcus. <laughs> sulcus beneath the gum line. So this is a test that we can do that is confirming what Mary has just explained to all of us, right? And so what is the call to action? Home care plus a full mouth exam or cohat. And so metabolites that, that we're testing for are sulfur compounds called thiols. And the more thiols, it's associated with tissue, tissue destruction that Mary was telling us about, and they're produced as that gingival sulcus deepens. And it becomes a, you know, it, it has a potential to become a profound periodontal uh, pocket with increasingly anaerobic bacteria. So let's, there we go. Um, so we know, right? You hear me say, flip the lip, right? Well, that's that's all well and good, but we it doesn't give us a really in-depth view or visual exam of that pet's oral cavity, right? And so we're, we're not seeing the full extent of progressive periodontal disease. This strip, we can incorporate it into routine patient workup and it detects these thiol concentrations that reflect active periodontal disease. It is telling us that there is active periodontal disease and it is progressing. And so, you know, again, we as veterinary technicians should be incorporating these into our wellness exams, right? So we're doing fecals, we're doing heartworm tests, we're doing blood work. 10 seconds is all this takes. I just had to put a Frenchie on there. <laughs> so let me let me play this uh, video for you. So here we go. We're lifting that lip right along that gum line. And then we're gonna wait 10 seconds and compare that to um, that, uh, the scale on the side of the, uh, the tube that you saw earlier from Jameson and that you just saw um, on the earlier slide. So simple 10 second test for the early detection of periodontal disease. Negative, positive, it's not rocket science um, for, for us to read it, 
There's a whole bunch of science that goes on behind it, but to read it, it's not rocket science. And really it's empowering us to educate our clients about periodontal disease. And it's better for the pet, right? And think about the pain that Mary was talking about. Our, if our pets are in pain, our patients are in pain, that definitely disrupts that human animal bond. So by figuring out what is causing this pain and with our veterinarians diagnosing periodontal disease, then we will see a huge benefit to the family and pet bond. I just want to add, Kara, that the strip may not be completely yellow like it was on some of the images yeah. we saw there. Um, any amount of yellow, whether it's just a yellow dot or two, that is indicative of pain. I mean, of the thiols being present. So um, any amount of color change um, is an indication that we have some degree of disease going on. So it doesn't have to be a bright yellow pad like we have in those images. Right. Um, it can just be a couple little yellow dots and we have a positive test. Yep, absolutely. Thank you. All right, so home care, very important part of periodontal therapy, right? So we know that there are at-home oral hygiene um, products. There's uh, the goal really is daily plaque control to control gingivitis and periodontal disease. As Mary said, and as we know, we brush our teeth twice a day and most pet owners aren't doing anything. We know it's critical to successful periodontal therapy. So, you know, it provides plaque and calculus control between those professional treatments. And so, you know, there are procedures, there's products that clients use on their pet. It's a critical, critical adjunct to periodontal therapy, to cohat treatments, and you know, to professional intervention. And it's essential to sustain the success of professional periodontal therapy. And it's effective when it provides plaque and calculus control, but there are thousands of products out there that don't have evidence to support the efficacy of the product. And, you know, it, the amount alone is confusing. And, you know, many of the claims on there can be misleading to our, our pet owners. And so again, it's up to us as the veterinary healthcare team, we are the best resource for making appropriate therapeutic and home care recommendations. So when we're talking home care, there's really three parts, connection, compliance, and confusion, right? So the three C's of, um, of uh, dental home care. So first, we have to help our owners make the connection. Periodontal disease is not immediately life-threatening, right? I mean, if a hit by car comes in and there's blood spurting everywhere, we know that's immediately life-threatening. The client knows that that's immediately life-threatening, but periodontal disease, you know, isn't. Preventive care, right? What we're talking about right now, um, you know, doing periodontal therapy and home care, much, much less sexy, right? Than periodontal surgery. But I don't, I don't know. I don't think we got into this profession for the sexiness of it, right? We got I into, <laughs> well, yes, Mary did. Um, she doesn't have her tiara on right now. I don't have but my tiara on today. We got into this to help our patients, right? To help animals feel and live better and longer. And we also know that client education takes time, but it is extremely important. It's important in every disease condition, but it's very, very important when we're talking about periodontal disease. And so, you know, if we're talking about compliance, compliance is, you know, in, in a nutshell, the pet is receiving the care that the veterinary team believes is best for that specific patient. And it's really a formula, um, what we call the craft formula. 
So compliance equals recommendation, acceptance of that recommendation, and follow through. And so, you know, depending on what it is, we can make the recommendation or our veterinarians are making the recommendation, right? Who's responsible for acceptance? We are. That falls on us. And what do I mean by that? We need to ensure that the pet owner understands what the recommendation is, why it was made, and how, you know, periodontal therapy or any product specifically helps their pet to live longer, to have less um, uh, plaque buildup, right? That falls on us. And then follow through. Follow through is always extremely important. I don't think I have to tell you guys that. So, you know, the client doesn't realize because they don't see it. You know, if this was an infection somewhere else on the body that was seen, it'd be taken care of just like that, right? It'd be treated immediately. But both of these need intervention. I mean, look at the gingivitis, right? And we have some plaque buildup. And then just, I mean, this is just nasty. We all know that. We like to do these because the before and after, you know, is so gratification. Yeah, it's so stark. But we need to explain what is happening here and how that affects their their patient, their their pet. Home care is confusing, right? You walk into any pet store and there's hundreds of pet oral hygiene products. Most of these, as I said, are, are products sold over the counter. And most of them lack evidence for e efficacy, right? How do we know if, if these are actually helping with home care, with um, plaque buildup, with, you know, with periodontal disease? Well, the Veterinary Oral Health Council cuts through the noise, right? We are now, I, veterinary medicine is, an evidence-based evidence -based medicine, right? We want to be able to have the evidence that is going to show us, the research that's going to show us, you know, that something is a, a treatment or a management is efficacious. And so the VOHC helps cut through that noise and helps demonstrate the company's commitment to science. And it truly does elevate the the Venner Healthcare team's uh, recommendation. So it's really the practice of making medical decisions through the judicious, uh, uh, yeah, easy for me to say, identification, evaluation, and application of the most relevant information. And it's the integration of the best research evidence with clinical expertise and patient values. So again, clinically relevant research, the use of clinical skills and past experience coupled with patient values, right? Each pet owner is unique. Each pet owner is going to have their own preferences, their concerns, their expectations. And not only the, the, the pet owner, but we have to consider the patient as well. And so, you know, as we get into talking about some products, I want to continue to bring us back to the VOHC. The VOHC awards the seal in two claim categories, helps control plaque, helps control tartar. And you can see here, or there's there's um, the, the seal that helps control plaque and tartar, right? Obviously this gold standard, but we're this is what we are looking for in educating our pet owners to look for on the label, um, we can have them go to, or we can go to the VOHC uh, website, but this way we know that there is some evidence behind these, the products that we are recommending, and we can see whether or not they're efficacious. So the, the VOHC helps to supplement professional care by providing effective plaque control between professional interventions. And that's really essential to sustainable oral health. These products have demonstrated efficacy, 
supported by randomized, blinded, and controlled studies. The company trials are reviewed and approved by an independent, independent council of veterinary dental experts. And one of those experts is on the call tonight. Mary Berg is the only veterinary technician, the vet, uh, vet tech specialist in dentistry that is on the VOHC council. And also the VOHC is recognized and endorsed globally. When we're talking to our owners, how many of us would use a, a toothpaste that was not ADA accepted, right? I remember hearing about the ADA when I was young, have to get an ADA approved toothpaste. Well, in the veterinary world, we want to equate that with the VOHC. And so we want to encourage our owners to look for products, or we wanna make recommendations to our owners for products that are uh, VOHC um, accepted. Now we know that toothbrushing is the gold standard, right? No one is disputing that. But what's the evidence? Is there evidence for mechanical plaque and tartar control? Yeah, there's, there's great evidence. Evidence grade one and two, um, what, it's basically one through four, one being the highest. Um, and so, and it controls 80 to 90% of plaque and tartar. But are we doing it on our own pets? Are pet owners doing it on our patients? What do you think? <clears throat> no, you would be correct. 30% clients reported, uh, clients reported um, a compliance rate of 30%. Now, yeah, come on. 30% something on that. Yeah. That's... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to throw a flag on that I'm one. I'm going to throw a flag on that one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. If someone asked me in a, yeah, yeah. well, I'm being honest with you, so I'd be honest with them, but come on. We know that they're probably fudging a little bit. Um, it's actually. They might brush once every six weeks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's actually um, a very, very low percentage, which is too bad because we send home toothbrushes, we send home toothpaste, we talk about it, and that's it. So we need to, to do a lot more. Remember that, you know, compliance, we have to show them how to do it. We have to tell them how often to do it. Have them do it in front of us. Have them practice brushing their pet's teeth in front of us and follow up with them. Because toothbrushing truly is the gold standard, but not enough people are doing it. And then, hey, you knew I'd get to diet, right? <laughs> so dietary effects of periodontal health. Well, there are studies. And those studies suggest that, you know, uh, soft, soft foods promote plaque accumulation, fibrous textures, um, reduce plaque and cal calculus accumulation. There's a myth that dry, crunchy foods prevent plaque and calculus accumulation. So what do you think? Is that true? Just, you know, if you have a, a dry kibble, that will clean those teeth. Well, if you answered no, then you would be correct. Because here, right, this is your regular old kibble. And this kibble, when the tooth bites into it, the fibers are crisscrossed. And the tooth, the, um, the kibble just shatters. At most, maybe the apex of the tooth is cleaned, but that's even a stretch. So with dental diets, right, as one of our home care um, alternatives, one of our home care um, choices, that tooth goes into the kibble. Now this kibble is slightly bigger and the fibers are aligned. So the tooth bites into it, the kibble doesn't just crumble, and it, it cleans that tooth. So you've probably heard that before, um, but what is, what's the evidence? Well, evidence grade one and two, and there's peer reviewed publications supporting the efficacy of dental diets as effective control of plaque, calculus, stain, malodor, and gingivitis. 
And, and just to add to that, I, I did about like, you know, seven, six, seven hundred studies on this. It works. <laughs> I was just going to say, and Mary was part of these studies. <laughs> I know so, it works. Um, so, yeah. So here we have, you know, a control diet, right? So the, the mouth is cleaned. And for both of these guys on a control diet, you can see gingivitis, right? Some plaque starting to accumulate with the therapeutic dental diet. Uh, it's looking pretty darn good. This was a six month study. Yes, both sorry. These were six month studies. Yeah, so, right. Sorry, I That's thought right. I said that, I, but I, I didn't. I'm just having flashbacks. It's okay. No yeah. <laughs> and then we have, um, you know, the, the controlled diet. And again, the dental diet, 25 weeks post profi, um, periodontal therapy. And again, look at this diet. Look at these gums and the teeth versus the dental diet. So you can see why there's grade one, grade um, two evidence there. So, all right, there's a ton of others and we're not gonna be able to cover them all tonight. Um, that would be uh, a, a very long workshop. <laughs> um, but if we look at, you know, rawhide treats, there's evidence for rawhide treats, um, dental rawhide treats as, as they are so um, kindly called. And yeah, there is evidence Grade two evidence for captive's control when fed two to three times a day. So these rawhide treats have to be fed two to three times a day. And, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm probably not going to be feeding my dogs two to three rawhide chews a day. And so, you know, I'm not, I'm not bashing anything. I'm trying to encourage us to read the labels, right? Read the directions. We all we all know and, and like some of these, right? But we have to see, you know, what do the studies show? What are the directions saying? So here every day, the pet has to get two to three of those. And then, you know, what about baked biscuits? Well, there's evidence grade two, there's data to de demonstrate no significant benefit. So, you know, it, it goes the opposite there. It's telling us there is no significant benefit. And then, you know, everything out there pretty much is saying, oh, it's for dental health, it's for oral health. Well, there's no evidence of effectiveness for um, toys like this. And then what about chemical plaque control? Chlorhexidine, we all use chlorhexidine, right? So several studies show a reduction of plaque and gingivitis in you know, dogs in a laboratory setting. There's grade four evidence for enzyme systems. There's a published study in dogs um, in, that involves the use of enzyme tooth gel without tooth brushing. And there's one small study of enzyme containing dental hygiene chews in cats. So really what we want you to take away is, you know, get to know the products that are out there. And we know how busy you are. If you don't have the time to, to look up, you know, whatever your clients are coming in and asking you about, look at the VOHC. Or send me an email. I'll help you out. <laughs> you send either one of us an email. Yeah. Because um, <laughs> we can most certainly help. So polyphosphates, right, is grade two evidence um, for, for calculus. And you see some of these as um, uh, coding on various treats and foods. Um, they're sequestrants. Polyphosphates are sequestrants that are binding that salivary calcium. So when Mary was talking about the, the, the salivary um, gland and, and all the um, saliva buildup, well, this is, is helping to, to bind that salivary calcium. There's no data on control of plaque accumulation. So the evidence for this is grade two for calculus. There's no evidence for control of gingivitis. So, so again, 
there's, you know, multiple home care categories, mechanical plaque and tartar control. We, that's what we've been talking about with toothbrushing, dietary cleansing, chemical plaque control with antimicrobials and enzyme systems, chemical tartar control with those chelating agents that bind to, um, to other agents and try to um, control the, the tartar. And then I think there's one product, Mary, left, two? Okay, that are um, barrier agents or, or dental sealants. If I can find and They just don't agent. let the plaque adhere to the tooth. So that's basically, um, and, and doesn't let it grow up. One of them doesn't let it go subgingivally. So what Mary and I have been trying to bring to you tonight is that oral health is a combination of professional therapy, and effective substrate control, i.e. home care, right? It's not a once a year procedure and there's no one product that fits all. It's not a one size fits all. So we encourage questions. We also, um, I have our emails coming up. Um, please feel free to, to email um, and ask questions, ask questions about a specific product. Um, we're here for you. I want to thank Aura Strip DX for um, sponsoring this session tonight and um, uh, remind you that it's the early detection of active periodontal disease in awake dogs and cats. And um, Jameson gave this to me because I am not hip. Um, I don't know how to make a QR code, but I do know that that's a QR code, which you can scan and it will take you okay. to the uh, to the Aura Strip uh, website. And there's some great information on that website. Um, again, you know, we've been talking about evidence and research. There's a lot of research papers on there that prove, um, that show the efficacy uh, for Aura Strip, um, as well as um, there's information on periodontal disease, et cetera. So we thank you. Um, uh, Mary has an adorable dog name Gypsy. Here's Gypsy. And when Mary's working, Gypsy's working. <laughs> and then you guys probably know about my Frenchies and my Persian. Um, Mary is from Kansas. I uh, was in Kansas and I'm a huge, we're both huge Chiefs fans. So, um, so there we go. Um, don't, don't throw anything at us for that. Um, so oh, questions, comments. I think we had a few questions in the box. Okay. Yeah. Do you want me to read them or do you want to read them, Mary or Carol? Um, I can go ahead and do it. I'm just trying okay. to get my, my thing to open up. No, that's the chat. That's why it doesn't open. Okay. The first question we had is, dum, dum, dum. In your opinion, what is the best home care for cats that don't cooperate with toothbrushing? Oh, well, I'm going to take a shot at that one if you're okay with that. Um, and we can throw in, um, I'm actually a big believer in, I mean, I, I kind of alluded to the fact that I did work with Hills as a consultant during the development of TD and spent most of the time in dog and cat's mouths. Um, I know that product works well, especially for cats. It's like close to 60% plaque removal for cat feline TD. Um, and it's a great almost lifetime diet. Um, my cat is, is 17 and she's still getting TD um, every day. Um, we sent a full bag, a five pound bag home um, when I was in practice of TD for every dog and cat that could eat it after a dental cleaning. It's probably, you know, we don't have to brush, but we got to feed them every day. So let's look at doing something like that. There are some chews available, um, greenies and some other ones. But, you know, if your cat's not going to chew them, you know, is it really worth trying to do that? But, um, yeah, those are some things. There's also some wipes, some animals that don't like having a tooth brushed may accept a wipe. So those are some other options for you, Anne-Marie. Yeah, and, um, and I would second that because of um, Ollie, who you see in the, the middle picture there is on TD. Um, and, you know, he's a brachycephalic, so he's got a mush face, right? Um, and it's, it's worked beautifully for him. Um, and to Mary's point, I think um, my second would be wipes. Uh, for for a cat, it only takes a few seconds to get in there, and they're after a little bit of reward and stuff, they accept that. Um, Janet asked about after dental 
Dr. Dentals, which is not a word. Remember, that's a <laughs> noun. Um, do you recommend putting pets on a dental diet? Actually, I just kind of alluded to that, that yeah, yeah. Um, we put every patient who could eat it on a dental diet after um, when I was in practice. And it did make a huge difference on some of our pets. Um, the next question is, how many minutes is the color of the aura strip stable? Um, that's a good question. I want to say it's probably at least a good 10 minutes. Um, and I'm just recently, I just started a study last week that I'm incorporating aura strip into, and, um, I'm seeing it for at least about 10 minutes or so that it'll stay stable. Um, if you don't know for sure how long it's going to be, and you want to talk to somebody about it, you know, snap a picture of it, um, of that test strip so that you can show your doctor if they're yeah. not available at that moment. But I mean, uh, within 10 seconds, you, you get, you're gonna see you know, the it, answer. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but how long does it stay on the color? Because it will go yeah. back to white eventually. Yeah. Um, I'll let you answer the next one, Kara. Um, how should a brown color on the aura strip be interpreted? Is it due to tartar, blood, or dirt? Yes. And is it positive for thiols? <laughs> yes. Um, brown color can be any or all. It could be tartar, dirt, blood. Um, and you know, I'm thinking that if it has tartar dirt or blood or that brown, um, stuff on it, then, then yeah, um, it's, it's positive for periodontal disease. Um, because if, if you're running that strip and it's, it's ending up with, um, a, any color, but a color, you know, due to blood, um, or tartar, then yeah, that is a mouth that definitely needs um, some treatment and Cohad is going to be the best way to, uh, to truly examine what's going on in that mouth and make it, and then make a treatment plan. And one thing just to clarify, it's probably gonna be the plaque you're seeing. Tartar doesn't come off very easily. It's the plaque. Um, the other thing I would recommend on some of these patients that you find that yeah, a kind of brown strip is maybe take another strip and run it more above the gingiva um, and not actually touch the tooth itself. Um, and that will sometimes give you a result um, without having any of the um, clutter, let's say from the, the plaque and blood on the strip. But um, that's another option to do that. Uh, next question is, what situation should you perform a root canal versus extraction? Well, that's kind of a little out of the wheelhouse right here. Um, but I will just tell you that if you can, there's certain teeth in the mouth that I'm going to talk about a root canal any day um, over the next, and that's going to be my mandibular canines, uh, my um, maxillary fourth um, and mandibular molar and my maxillary canines are going to be the ones I'm going to try to save if I can. They're so structurally important for that patient. Um, I think the next question, I don't kind of jumped here for a minute. Let me see here. What one. is the shelf life? What's the life? shelf life? Yeah, I don't after they've been open. Um, I know it's a two year shelf life once they're shipped. Um, I've, I'll be honest with you, I've had them here in my office and I've used them and it's been a long time and they're still working. So yeah. I think they're pretty stable. Jameson, maybe you can throw in on that one. Yes, two years, two years. opened or not okay. open, two years stable shelf life. Gotcha. All right. Thank you. Um, is it reliable for dogs and cats? Yeah. Yep. It does. It works in cats and dogs. Um, and uh, yeah, you can use it on yourself, but I don't want to know about it. All right. <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, I don't do people. How do the strips differ from those of about seven years ago? It's basically a lot of it's the same technology. The strip is now um, we've kind of done some revisions in the strip itself to make it a little bit stiffer, for lack of a better word. Um, and we've repackaged it um, and things like that from the original one that's been out several years ago. So it is a little bit easier to use. I'm um, a little bit longer strip as well as just a little stiffer, um, but the technology is basically the same. Am I correct, Jameson? The pad is also wider, wider? and okay. we've made we've made the reagents um, react along a brighter color gradient. Okay, thank you. I knew there was something else, but I couldn't remember what it was. Yeah, thank you. Oh, and it's way cheaper than it used to be. Yes. Way cheaper. That's I was the, gonna say that. That's yeah. That's another yeah. very the packaging. Important. Yeah. Yeah. The packaging <laughs> has changed and it's much less expensive than it used to be. Yeah. 
uh, Kara, you want to touch the water additives? <laughs> well, it says your opinion. Um, uh, well, I know. Um, so, yeah, I, I know that there is um, one or two that have the VOHC um, seal. That's several now, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I guess if that's all that someone can can do, then, you know, then then great. We can make that recommendation. I'm I'm going to want something a little um, more substantial, for lack of a better way of saying it, um, yeah. more along that mechanical um, removal. So, again, I, I, it's an option for us and there will be, you will have a pet and a patient that, um, that that will be the only thing they can have. So it's good that we have that option. The majority of my patients though, I am going to be uh, recommending something um, a little more uh, mechanical. Um, so uh, like a, a diet or a wipe, uh, tooth brushing, um, as long as I'm also educating about tooth brushing. Yeah, and the thing too is I'd always recommend, especially with, with water additives and caps, um, make sure they're drinking it. Um, sometimes that water additive changes the taste a little bit. And you know, cats, they're pretty finicky. Yeah. So um, I would make sure that you always offer an option. But, you know, as, as Kara said, it's, it's, it's a tool in the toolbox. Um, don't feel that you're going to get a 50 to 60% plaque reduction using water additives or sprinkles or any of the other things yeah. that are out there like that. Yeah. And definitely have your, your pet owner really do intake, um, yeah. because of if, if the cat's not drinking, we have probably, or More the issues. dog, you know, we, we have issues. Um, and, and as Mary said, it's going to be more, um, uh, specific to the cat because cats do not like change in their food, in their, their texture of the food, in their water. Um, and they will stop drinking. Um, if something is funky with their water, they'll stop eating if something's funky with their food. So just, just, you know, educate the owner to, to keep an eye out, but thank you for the that next, question. Yeah. The next question is a conceivable that dental chews such as Oravet and yummy combs do not do anything or just slowing down the periodontal disease. Well, they do actually do things. Yeah. Um, Oravet itself is a soft enough chew that when the animal chews it, it's actually squeegeeing the plaque off the teeth, as well as has a product in it called demopanol, yeah. which coats the tooth. Um, and it actually helps it um, not adhere, but the opposite of here. <laughs> Re doesn't allow plaque to adhere to the tooth is what I'm trying to get at. So yes, it does help a lot with yeah. that. Is it going to be the only thing you ever need to do? Probably not. It is going to slow down. It may keep the mouth healthy. My girl, little gypsy there, she gets an Oravet a day. Okay. Um, yummy combs are a little bit harder, um, but they're doing the same thing. They're basically kind of cleaning the teeth. They do not have a chemical in them that does it, uh, but they are the, the mechanical chewing of it. Yeah. Um, and again, it's patient it. specific. Um, yeah, everybody's you know, different. Some will eat it, some won't. Yeah, and and Oravet, you know, my my dogs will will eat Oravet, but they won't eat yummy combs. And it's not nothing against yummy combs. It's just it's patient. It's pet specific. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, the last question Robin had is: My dentist uses a mini camera to do interoral cam uh, pictures. Is that available in veterinary medicine? Yes, it is. Um, it's been out for um, way back when. Dirt was young and I started in the field um, in veterinary dentistry. We had interoral cameras back then. It is available, um, but you do have to, you know, it's not gonna be the, probably the most inexpensive thing in the world. Um, you know, one of these things right here now are advanced with our phones do a great job of getting those cam those pictures as well as we can too. So, but I think that's all the questions we have. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. It seems like all the questions have been answered, and I would like to thank both you, Mary and Kara, for a wonderful uh, webinar tonight and giving us all your expertise, and a huge thank you to Aura Strip for sponsoring our webinar tonight. We thank you, Aura Strip, and if anybody has any other questions, throw it in there in the Q&A. If not, Kara and Mary, their emails were there, or you can yeah. email us at NAFTA, and we can get the information to one of them. But I would like to thank everybody again for joining us tonight and um, have a great evening, everybody.
Thank you, Thank everyone. You. Bye. Have a good one. Take care.